Hello everyone, it's Monday night, April 13th, it's time for Stories in the Magic Library. This is David Domine in the highlands of Louisville, Kentucky, getting ready to talk about Old Louisville, one of the largest historic preservation districts in the country, 48 square blocks of old houses, over a thousand mansions and homes. If you love uh, old houses, great architecture, it's the, the place to be. Uh, there's some ghosts there and some interesting people as well, so... It's a very, very interesting neighborhood. Welcome, everyone. I see Beth and Laura, Missy, Chris, Jill. Hi, Catherine. Welcome back. Hope you all had a good day. So if you're checking in, say hi. Let people know where you're from. And uh, we met some interesting characters as well. Last night we met Cookie, who is a, a man that hangs around the neighborhood and runs into me at always inopportune moments. So we might see him again tonight. Uh, there's a woman, supposedly she's a voodoo woman by the name of Josephine. She makes appearances every now and then. And, uh, we also met Loretti, my neighbor across the street who lived up on the top floor of the Hillebrandt, a high rise building. And she kind of became, uh, Hey, Luis Miguel and Amanda and Susan and Ashley, Jackie, hi Eileen. And, uh, she would sit up in her, uh, window and kind of watch down over the neighborhood and, she would call whenever she saw anything suspicious. So that's where we left off last night. But we're going to pick up, and uh, the next chapter is called Another Voodoo Day. Uh, let's have a toast. Welcome, everyone. Let people know what you're drinking. I'm shaking things up tonight, and I'm doing a vodka martini. Shaken, not stirred, and with a twist of lemon. So, hey, Susan. Cheers, and... Welcome to the Magic Library. By the way, you can check in at the Magic Library. Uh, look for David's Magic Library on Facebook or Instagram and uh, let people know you're here. You can also check in at America's Most Haunted Neighborhood, Old Louisville. So let's try to get the word out about this great uh, neighborhood. Hey, Nancy. Hey, Sean. Hey, Barban. Donnie, good to see you. So it's really nice to see all the familiar faces popping up every night. So can you believe we've been doing this over two weeks now? So I think we probably have another two weeks. Uh, I can probably milk this uh, book and let's hope, let's hope in two weeks uh, things are calming down and we can get out and about and won't need to have so much uh, a distraction in the evening. But uh, I got Our Lady of Perpetual Inebriation again tonight. So she's kind of the patron saint of the Magic Library and the Thursday slash Tuesday slash Monday Night Dinner Club. And uh, she's always around when lots of good stories are being told. Okay, so like I said, welcome if you're just checking in. Let people know where you're from. Say hi. Let us know what you're drinking. Hey, Jill. Hey, Marsha. And uh, invite your friends to join us. The more, the merrier. Okay, so we're going to pick up. This is actually page... 109 in the book. So we're about a third of the way through the book. So we're making good progress. But this chapter, like I said, is called Another Voodoo Day. So the next day, Loretti called me as I was testing a recipe for spare ribs and onion gravy. She informed me that in the morning twilight, before the sun had finally risen, several possums had been creeping along my fence and that the neighbor from three doors down had surreptitiously stowed one of his full garbage bags in our trash can before the sanitation trucks rolled through the alley on their weekly rounds. No sign of a gimp, she reported. The day after, I had another voodoo day. As I lay in bed that morning, for some reason, my mind started wandering to the time Julia Child dropped a turkey during a taping of the French chef, and then confided to the camera that the good thing about being the only one in the kitchen is that no one has to know what goes on there before she returned the kitchen, uh, the turkey to the roasting pan. When I went downstairs and turned on the little TV in the butler's pantry a half hour later, what was on? A documentary about Julia Child on A&E. And as it turns out, the scene with Julia dropping the turkey was the very first thing I saw as the picture came into view after turning on the television set. Hey, Thomas, VG, Steve, Bonnie, welcome back. So I watched the biography through to its end, and then I 
thought back to the days when I studied in Santa Barbara, California, which was where Julia Child resided in her final years. One afternoon, after returning from the downtown farmer's market, where I happened to see the large woman happily fonding, uh, fondling a Japanese eggplant, I was walking to class when a surfer dude with a surfboard strapped to his back sailed by on a skateboard playing a Peter, Paul, and Mary song on a guitar. Wait a minute, I thought to myself. Old Louisville's got lots of weirdos, so how come I've never seen a surfer dude sailing by on a skateboard playing a Peter, Paul, and Mary song on a guitar here? All of a sudden, a prickle of goosebumps rose on my arms, and I had a strange but familiar feeling. I got up and walked to the front parlor and looked through the large arched window. And what did I see out on the sidewalk in front of my house? A young ratty looking guy with long bleach blonde hair standing on a skateboard, rolling down to the next corner. A guitar strap over his shoulder, he strummed away on the instrument, barely noticing the old woman he almost ran off the sidewalk. I couldn't hear what he was playing, but I'm fairly confident it was something by Peter, Paul and Mary. And even though he didn't have a surfboard strapped to his back, it was enough of a coincidence to let me know I was in for a voodoo day. An hour later, I was standing in line at the Crogetto, kicking myself for not having gone elsewhere, uh, as a disheveled woman in front of me argued with the cashier. When I finally got to unload my cart and wait for the grand total, I surveyed the contents and hazarded a guess. Looks like a do looks like a hundred dollars and twenty. Uh, Looks like $122.79 worth of Crogetto merchandise, I thought to myself. Sure enough, when the cashier scanned the last item and gave the final tally, it came to $122.79, her words echoing in my head as the digital numbers flashed on the screen of the cash register. Hey, Kathy and Suzanne, Dorothy, Barbara, as I rolled the cart to the exit, I shrank back with a start. The electronic door popped open with a squeaky whoosh, and in walked Josephine, a golden turban with an emerald brooch snugly encasing her scalp and a lacy, loose-fitting blouse hanging from her shoulders. Her skirt billowed out as she sailed past me and headed for the produce department. A wicker basket swung at her side. I resisted the urge to squat and hide behind my cart and turned around so she wouldn't see my face. To add to the ruse, I put a coin in the nearest gumball machine instead. Jackpot! And out rolled 13 huge gumballs and not just the single one that a dime was supposed to get you. Voodoo days did have their advantages every now and then. And I greedily stuffed them into my pockets, hopeful the store security hadn't noticed my unjust enrichment. And when I lifted the metal flap, out rolled another 13, although I hadn't fed the machine a second time. I was debating whether or not I should lift the flap and press my luck for another 13 when I remembered that Josephine had entered the store. Quickly, I ran my purchases out to the car, stowed the gumballs, and soon found myself back in the store, inspecting a head of red cabbage while Josephine conversed with an employee several yards away. I couldn't really hear what she said, but in her hand she held a bunch of something green as she peppered the employee with questions. Giving Josephine a hopeless, wide-eyed look, the young girl wrinkled her nose and shrugged her shoulders before backing up and walking away. Josephine tossed the bundle into her basket and walked over to the milk case, no doubt in search of some odd dairy substance to heighten the magical effects of the mysterious green she had purchased. Throwing down the fresh pineapple I was pretending to scrutinize, I followed her. Hey, Amanda Rupert. The green shine of the brooch caught in the reflection of the glass door, and Josephine snagged a pint of buttermilk and tossed it into her basket. Then she breezed on, past the butter and cheese, past the potato chips and snacks, past the canned vegetables and tomato sauce, and entered the aisle for baking needs. She sauntered forward and came to a stop in front of the spices. A free hand stroking her chin, she studied the selection of jars and vials and shook her head slightly. I was relatively certain that there was nothing like broom tops, blood root, or brimstone to be had in the Crogetto spice aisle, but I did a quick mental rundown of the indispensable herbs and spices used in your everyday voodoo ceremony, and I soon realized that I knew next to nothing about voodoo. From a, 
From a brief bit of research on the internet, I knew voodoo botanicals included items with foreboding sounding names such as nightshade, devil's shoestring, and goofer dust, but I knew little about the actual requirements for the ceremonies themselves. What was Josephine looking for? Mandrake, mistletoe, mugwort, snake root, soapwort, sassafras? Whatever it was, she, she wouldn't find it here and would probably need to head over to Bardstown Road. Working with the choices at hand, I tried to figure out good substitutes in the event that I should get up the nerve and approach her with any suggestions. Allspice, lavender, anise, cloves, they all seemed rather exotic, but I doubted they'd be any uh, good in uh, raising the dead or turning enemies into zombies. So I put my incredible powers of reasoning to use. Voodoo came from Haiti, and Haiti was in the Caribbean, and so was Jamaica, and I soon came up with the answer. Jerk seasoning. Yes, Josephine must be looking for a substance that could both flavor chicken and facilitate the rendering of curses. I almost had a heart attack when Josephine reached up and grabbed the only jar of jerk seasoning on the shelves and put it in her basket. Granted, I had reached my tongue-in-cheek conclusion through questionable deductive powers of reasoning, but voodoo days were powerful things. Josephine exited the aisle, and I scrambled to catch up with her without drawing any attention when, other, when none other than Cookie himself emerged from behind a huge pyramid of canned chicken broth. How's about some of that cookie? He said with a loon grin. After our most recent encounter, I'd slowly started to wonder if the cookie he always talked about really referred to the chocolate chip or oatmeal raisin, my favorite, variety, but I, I had my reservations. I had decided to give him the benefit of the doubt, however, and I pointed at a display of Pepperidge Farm products artfully arranged at the end of the aisle as I tried to make my getaway. Cookies, yeah, uh, I said, right over there, see you later. Nah, not them cookies, he crowed with indignation as I scuttled to catch up with Josephine, but she was nowhere to be found. At the cash register, I saw only Nick, who lived two blocks down from me in a gorgeous Neo-Georgian mansion, so I ran back through the aisles in an attempt to locate Josephine. After five minutes, I realized I had lost her. You know you weren't gonna get some of that cookies. Cookie leapt out from behind a cardboard display uh, that uh, displayed assorted nuts. I rolled my, ar my eyes and prepared to lose him again, but then a thought struck me. Say, I said, do you know that woman who was just here? Woman, he repeated, she got them cookies? Although I wasn't sure I got the gist of the statement, I said, the woman um, that was just here with the gold turban and the long skirt, she had a basket on her arm. Did you see her? Josephine? He narrowed his eyes to distrustful slits. Yeah, I said, glad that I understood the whole utterance. That's the one I'm talking about. You know anything about her, Josephine? Josephine, gonna get some of that cookie? He stood up straight and squared his shoulders. Well, I'm not sure what you said, but I don't know anything about Josephine's cookies, I said. All I need to find out is if you know anything about her that doesn't involve cookies. We were in the aisle, and I realized I needed a box of linguine, so I stooped down to compare prices while I waited for his answer. Josephine gonna get one of that some of that problems, he explained. Problems? I said. She gonna get some of that devil trick. He nodded his head when he saw my pasta selection. Did you say devil trick? Oh yeah, some of that devil trick. Well, what do you mean by devil trick? Some of that there devil trick, dumbass. His face scrunched up in a, scrow in a scowl. Devil trick, voodoo. Really? My tone shifted a notch toward disbelieving. She's not really into voodoo, is she? While I waited for his answer, it slowly dawned on me that he had called me a dumbass, but I decided to let it pass. That there Josephine gonna get some of that one of that devil trick, he warned. Leave off of that. Okay, I said, whatever you said. Uh, the lascivious grin returned. When you gonna give me that some of that one of that cookies? I turned around and left. Given that the day had been plagued with so many odd occurrences, when I turned in late that night, I was hardly surprised that it would not be a quiet one. Lying in the cool darkness of the bedroom, I suddenly awoke from a deep sleep 
In the back of my mind, it seemed that I had heard sonorous chimes from the grandmother clock in the foyer, or maybe a creak off in the distance, but I wasn't sure if that was the cause of my abrupt awakening. In the house, all was silent, save for a gentle tick-tock downstairs, but I had the distinct impression someone else was in the house. I listened for a moment and tried to figure out what was causing my sense of unease, and then I realized that a light above the landing out in the hallway had been turned on. The bright light had no doubt caused me to wake up. Cautiously, I grabbed the baseball bat at the side of the bed and tiptoed through the door. I crept down the stairs and came to a stop in front of the grandmother clock in the foyer. The soft ticking subsided, and even though the chain weights hadn't reached even the halfway point, the pendulum came to a halt right before my eyes. The silver face of the clock read 3.30. After pulling up the weights and setting the pendulum back in motion, I made the rounds of the house and ascertained that nobody had entered uninvited. Ramon had most likely risen in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or something and had forgotten to turn the light off, I told myself. Nonetheless, I developed a routine when I searched the house for these strange noises and always concluded with a lookout over the front and the backyards. So I pulled open the front door and stood on the porch. No sign of anything unusual there. Then I walked to the back of the house, opened the door and went outside. After a quick survey of the yard, I readied myself to return to the house, but something caught my eye. Through the wooden slats of the back fence, I noticed the gleam of a light that seemed out of place. I studied it for several seconds and came to the realization that the light was coming from the interior of my car, the dome light. Somehow I must have turned it on when I had parked earlier in the evening and now it threatened to drain the battery. I returned to the kitchen and grabbed my keys before leaving the security of the back porch for the carport on the other side of the fence. The backyard consisted of a large above-ground swimming pool with a raised deck that enclosed half of it, and this wooden deck led from the back steps to the parking area at the rear of the house. As I approached the parked car, it became visible from my vantage point on the raised deck several feet above ground, and I saw that the dome light had indeed come on. But not because I had left it on. The door on the driver's side was wide open, and a form in a camouflage army jacket leaned over the steering wheel, his hands furiously at work on the steering column. Behind the car, in the middle of the alley, a second man was standing lookout. When he saw me, he turned and hightailed it down the alley. When his partner in crime realized he was being watched, he reached down at his side, withdrew something, and pointed it at me. It was a gun. That'd be a good cliffhanger, right? So that was our first chapter for tonight. I could make a really short night. We could just finish there and pick up tomorrow night, right? So cheers if you're all joining us. Like I said, I'm, I'm doing something different. I'm having a vodka martini tonight, so welcome. And uh, if there's any newcomers, say hi. Let us know where you're from. Hey, Patty. Hey, Margie. If you don't remember Margie from last night, she lives in the very building where Loretti lived. I think she lived above her two floors on the other side of the building, if I remember correctly. Uh, Jason Cooper. Hi, Helena. Jamie. Becky. Andrew. Yeah, <laughs> Andrew says I'm a tease. So, hmm, should we read some more? Yeah, we'll read another chapter or two. So, it was a gun. Okay. So, now the next chapter is Gypsies, Gimps, and Thieves. So, everyone settle in. This is about, uh, this is a longer chapter compared to the others, but about seven pages. But uh, people from the Monday Night Dinner Club, they, they remember this from one of the stories I told uh, at our next uh, nightly dinner party. It happened uh, right the night before. But Gypsies, Gimps, and Thieves, okay? So remember, uh, the guy had just pulled out a gun and aimed it at me, okay? So I immediately fell to the ground, shocked. I had never caught anyone in the act of hot-wiring my car, nor had anybody ever pointed a gun at me before. 
I rolled off to the side, found a knot hole in the fence, and peered through it. I assumed the crook would race down the alley as fast as his friend had. However, he appeared to be in no hurry. Slowly, the man exited the car and quietly shut the door behind him. Then he, had, then he grabbed something he had propped against the side of my car and started to walk nonchalantly down the alley. He had a pronounced limp and walked with the assistance of a forearm crutch, the kind of crutch where the user slips an arm into a cuff and holds a grip for support. The gimp, I said under my breath, quickly reprimanding myself for the lack of political correctness. Muttering, I dragged myself to my feet. I debated running inside to wake Ramon, but I decided to yell for him instead. I didn't want to let the perpetrator get away, after all. Ramon! Ramon! Someone's trying to steal the car! From somewhere deep inside, I could hear Fritz frantically barking. At least he had heard me. I shouted several more times, but Ramon's window remained dark, a testament to his ability to snore through anything. Up on the third floor, there was no light or movement from Victor's room either. I'd be dead by the time they finally woke up. Remembering the cell phone I had grabbed when I left the security of my bed a half hour before, I punched in the number of the police and I exited the back gate so I could trail the would-be car thief. He had left the gun on top of the car when he grabbed the crutch, so I felt relatively safe following him. When the dispatcher answered and asked what the matter was, I told her two men had just tried to steal my car. After giving my address, I told her that one of them, a youth in his 20s with black jeans and a red basketball jersey and matching cap, was headed south on 4th Street at that very moment. The police would no doubt see him when they rushed over from the substation in the middle of Central Park, only a few blocks away. The other, I said, an older male, was still in the alley behind my house, headed for Ormsby Avenue. What's that one look like? she asked. Well, I caught up to him and took a better look. Well, he looks to be in his 50s, white, gray beard, and gray hair. He's wearing dirty blue jeans and a kind of army camouflage jacket that's zipped up all the way. He also has a black knit cap on and a beat up uh, set of brown boots with the laces untied. Wooey! She said, you got a good look at that one, didn't you? Well, yeah, I said, I'm right here, walking next to him. What do you mean? He's still there? I heard what I imagined to be heavily manicured nails clacking out a description on the keyboard. Yeah, he's right here beside me, I said. Stoically, the man with the limp slowly made his way down the alley, pretending that I wasn't there. What, he's not big into getaways? Only want to wait around to get caught? Well, he can't really run away. I turned away from the man and lowered my voice a decibel. He sort of has a bad lip and can't walk very fast, I said. What? said the voice at the other end of the line. Is he crippled? Yes, I said, although I don't think the Americans with disabilities would approve of your choice of vocabulary. He uses one of those Canadian crutches. Canadian crutch? What's that? asked the dispatcher, her nails hammering out a set of instructions. You know, one of those crooked crutches they put on uh, and they put their arm through uh, and they lean on it. It's got a handle halfway down for them to grab and hang on to. His is red. I looked over and watched the man gingerly maneuver his way along a patch of rough cobblestones. Oh, she said, one of them. Yep, he's a gimp, all right. I watched the end of the alley up ahead, thoroughly anticipating the wall of sirens and screeching wheels at any second. In the five minutes since discovery, the man had progressed about a hundred feet, and according to my calculations, it would take another five minutes before he reached the street ahead. Uh, Justin, you're dying. Good. Yeah, this is one of the funniest scenes, actually. I laughed so hard when I wrote this and remembered it. So from the other end, the dispatcher barked out a series of commands. Wait right there. Don't move. Stay by your car so the police know where to go. But what if the guy gets away? Stay by your car, insisted the dispatcher. He's not going anywhere. Well, he's trying awfully hard, I said. And by my side, the car thief had picked up his pace, no doubt spurred on by the confirmation that the police were on their way. 
And there are all kinds of places he could hide around here. All he needs to do is sneak between the buildings and they'll never find him, I said. Stay by your car, repeated the voice from the other end. I hung up, reluctantly, and I ran back to my car and stood out in the middle of the alley to better keep an eye out for the failed car thief. Valiantly, he was trying his hardest to escape. In another two or three minutes, he would reach the end of the alley. I paced back and forth and looked at the time on the cell phone. More than five minutes had passed since I dialed the police, and there was still no sign of screeching tires or welling sirens. In the house, Fritz was still barking, but there was no sign of movement or lights going on anywhere. Under the yellow glare of a street lamp at the end of the alley, I could see the car thief stop and contemplate his options. He was looking for a place to hide, and instead of limping all the way down to Ormsby Avenue, he turned left into a parking lot behind a large mansion that had been converted into offices. Within a couple of minutes, he had disappeared into the shadows. Impatiently, I continued to pace the alleyway until I could take it no longer. Another five minutes passed, and the police were nowhere in sight, so I sauntered down the alley to the spot where the crook had last stood. Off to the left, a row of imposing mansions with narrow strips of yard between them provided ample opportunity for cover. I was certain that the darkness had swallowed him up, and I turned to return to my car when a voice from somewhere overhead got my attention. Psst, he's over there. A man's voice came from a darkened third floor window in the apartment building across the alley. Although I couldn't see anybody, I could sense the figure as it stood there and pointed. Over there, behind the wall, the disembodied voice said. He's crouched down. I woke up when I heard you screaming before, and I've been watching him ever since. Thanks, I said. Over beyond a low brick wall that connected two of the old mansions, a shadow shifted and revealed the hiding spot. Sorry for you waking you up, I said. No prob, the voice whispered. Lots of freaks down here in old Louisville. At that moment, a line of squad cars came barreling into the alley and out popped a total of eight officer, four different squad cars. After a quick rundown, half of them went to inspect the car, while the others remained at the mouth of the alley with me. A tall officer with chestnut hair wrote down the particulars as I told him what had happened. When I pointed to where the crook had gone to hide, another went over and peered over the low brick wall. Then, almost comically, he reached down and pulled the reluctant man up by the collar of his shirt. Holding the crutch, uh, he helped the man over the fence and guided him over to an officer with a notepad. While two officers questioned the man, the other two walked over to the car with me, and uh, we joined the others. Is this yours? asked one of them, a short woman with a buzz cut, holding a gun out to me. It was the gun the man had left on top of the car when he fled. Uh, no, that would be his, I said, motioning with my head, at the suspect. Not real, anyway, said the woman with the buzz cut. She pulled the trigger and out sputtered a flaxed stream of water. It was a squirt gun. Well, uh, that's nice to know. Sheepishly, I kicked the toe of my shoe along a patch of gravel in the cobblestone before looking the other way. This yours? A heavy-set man with a buzz cut slid out of the driver's side of my car and held up a long, thin strip of metal for my inspection. The bottom portion had several notches and indentations in it. The top part was curved. Uh, no. I assume that would be his as well. I motioned again with my head at the suspect. I'm not an expert in these things, but that appears to be a slim gem, right? Maybe, maybe not said the male buzz cut. You sure you didn't forget to lock your car? What's, got, what's that got to do with it, I said, my ire rising. Even if I hadn't locked my car, which I'm not saying I did, that doesn't mean the general criminal public is invited to steal my car, does it? Maybe, maybe not, said the male buzz cut again. I pointed to the metallic device he held in his hand. 
I think most rational people could safely assume that the thing you have in your hand right now is a Slim Jim and that the man over there, I pointed, used it to get inside my car. Hmm, said Mr. Buzzcut. I rolled my eyes. Well, it's not mine, I said. At that point, the officer who had been questioning the car thief joined the others and they conferred for several minutes in a huddle. The one who had done the questioning broke away from the group and walked over to me. So, what do you want us to do now? He tucked the notepad away in his back pocket. What do you mean? I said. Well, what are you supposed to do now that we're here? Well, why don't you tell me? I said. You're the police, aren't you? What do the police usually do when they find someone breaking into cars? Depends, said the officer. I bit my tongue and tried to tone down the sarcasm mounting in my voice. You arrest people like this, don't you? And then you take them away, right? No can do, he said. Why not? You're supposed to lock up the bad guys. No can do, he said. We're not set up to take gimps downtown. What? I was certain I had heard wrong. Are you saying you're not going to arrest him because he has a limp? And what was up with everyone using that word all of a sudden, I thought to myself. Affirmative. He walked over to the car and laid the squirt gun and the Slim Jim on the hood. We don't have facilities to house those with disabilities, he said. Good grief. So what happens if he kills someone? Does he still get off because of the limp? Depends, said the male buzz cut. Behind him, two officers cheered on by the onlookers had gathered around a portable video game and furiously worked the controls. The man who had tried to hotwire my car huddled in as well. It was becoming painfully obvious that the conversation was going nowhere. I was reluctantly uh, made ready to go back to the house, or I reluctantly made ready to go back to the house when a thought hit me. A memory from a lecture during my... Uh, my time at law school many years before, and uh, I turned and I stopped Mr. Bugs Cut before he joined the crowd around the video game. Hey, I said, even if you're not going to take him downtown, I can still press charges, can't I? He stopped and turned around slowly, a clear lack of enthusiasm evident in the sour look he gave me. Yeah, I suppose. Good, I said, that that's what I'd like to do. So what am I supposed to do now, he said. Well, not being the official from law enforcement here, I said, I'm not sure, but I was hoping to get the man's information. Address, telephone number, copy of his driver's license. All right. The officer rolled his eyes a bit and looked to the side, but he gave no indication of getting the information and handing it over. This was worse than pulling teeth. After a brief and awkward silence, I finally broke down. Okay, would you please go get his contact information and give it to me? Yeah, sure thing. With a complete absence of gusto, the officer reluctantly walked over to the thief, who acted very put out to have to give any more information, and returned with a sheet of notepaper with the man's name and address. He was living with his brother on 4th Street in the house right across the alley. I thanked the officer and turned to go, but a snippet of conversation he had exchanged with the others caused me to stop and listen. You see that crazy old gypsy woman over under the tree by the park? Asked one of the officers who had remained silent up to that point. That one you hauled in last week for vagrancy? That woman who looked like something straight out of the movies with the big gold hoops in her hair and ears and all? Said the short woman with the buzz cut. Yeah, that one drove by the tree near the corner of the park on the way over here, and there she was, sitting under the tree, like she owned the thing. Wait a minute, I said, approaching the throng. Are you talking about that tree at the corner of Park and Six, the one they call the witch's tree? Well, I haven't heard it called that before, answered Mrs. Buzzcut, but that sounds like the tree. It's all gnarled and has these weird jagged branches. Might as well call it the witch's tree, though, said the officer with the sandy brown hair. There always seemed to be a bunch of old hags hanging around there. I turned around and approached the cluster of police people. Say, have you ever heard of this woman they call the stick witch? I asked, happy to have finally found some use for the local police. 
She supposedly pushes this old cart around and collects branches and twigs from around the neighborhood, and they say she's been uh, seen over there by the tree a lot. Stick witch? The man with the buzz cut frowned as he said it. Doesn't uh, sound like anyone I've seen around here. Well, what about Josephine, I said. She's this voodoo woman who wears a big flouncy skirt and a turban. She lives over there in the same area. Voodoo woman? One of the policemen who hadn't said anything before looked at me askance. You mean like zombies and killing chickens? Yeah, I guess. I opened the trunk of the car and threw in the Slim Jim and the squirt gun. Who knew? They might come in handy someday. Silence had fallen over the group and I realized most of them were studying me with crooked grins. So you're telling us you see witches and voodoo ladies, asked the female officer who didn't have a buzz cut. Her mouth twisted in a smirk and she tried to keep from laughing. Well, you're the ones talking about seeing gypsies sitting under the tree, not me. Yeah, but she's not a real gypsy, said the officer with the brown hair. At least I don't think she is. She's a scam artist, said one of the others. Who knows, I said. Maybe she is, maybe she isn't. I looked down to one end of the alley where the slick glow of a street light lay reflected in the cobblestone, and then I looked down toward the other end. That's when I realized the man with the gimp had snuck off and was probably tucked away in bed already. At that point, one of the walkie-talkie things strapped to Mr. Buzzcut's shoulder squawked something unintelligible, and before I knew it, they had all piled into their cars and squealed out of the alley, lights flashing. Somewhere in the distance, an owl hooted, and I looked up at the starry sky and took a deep breath. What are you doing out here? Ramon had come to stand at the back steps and was looking at me. It's four o'clock in the morning. Thanks for the news flash, I said, closing the gate softly behind me. What finally woke you? Fritz kept barking. I guess he heard you out here. What are you doing? He bawled a fist and rubbed sleep from his eyes. Fritz, who had bounded down from the porch when he saw me, looked up and panted his concern with furiously wagging uh, a tail. I was pre preventing people from stealing the car, I said. It's a good thing one of us is a light sleeper. Do they break out a window or something? He positioned himself to get a better view of the car parked out back. Fritz fell on his back and accepted my thanks for his loyalty in the form of several vigorous belly scratches before jumping to his feet and running into the herb garden. No, they used something to jimmy the lock. I watched as Fritz sniffed around the base of a large lovage plant. Who is this Jimmy and why he tried to steal your socks? It was Victor, our Cuban friend, standing at the back door with a confused look on his face. Never mind, go back to bed. Someone was trying to steal the car, not my socks. But somebody come into the room and wake me and tell me to come downstairs, said Victor. So I come down. Well, I guess that was Ramon. I stopped and looked at Ramon for confirmation, but he shook his head and said he hadn't gone up to the third floor. Well, you probably heard me yelling down here, I said. I was making a, a commotion. Victor looked like he wanted to say something in protest, but I mounted the steps to go back into the house, and I stopped short of entering when I heard Fritz's low growl from the side garden. It was a growl he used when he found something he didn't like. What's he got now? Ramon asked. Hopefully it's not another possum. Ooh, said Victor. One of those mean little kitties with the long and pointy noses and the sharp and pointy teeth is? Fritz, come here, boy. I walked over to the area between our house and the next and called out again, but Fritz refused to come. Instead, another long growl issued from the darkness. Fritz, where are you? Come here. Ramon followed behind as we felt our way into the darkness. Several steps later, we found a thick shaft of light that sliced its way through the open gate in the short expanse of fence that joined the front of the two buildings. Nearby, in the shadows, we saw Fritz, his teeth bared at a form leaning up against the wall. Hey, who let this dog in the bathroom? Asked an indignant voice. We both jumped back and Fritz lunged forward and grabbed the speaker's pant leg. 
Once our eyes adjusted to the semi-darkness, we were able to see it was a young man in his 20s, and he was using the side of our house for a urinal. The bars had just closed, and I quickly surmised he must have gotten lost on his way home. It wasn't the first time this had happened. Does this look like a bathroom, dumbass? said Ramon, reaching down to detach Fritz from the man's pant leg. Fritz managed to get in a good nip before he was carried back to the porch. Hey, said the guy leaning against the wall. Someone get that dog out of the bar before he bites me again. Is this the Jimmy who tried to steal your socks? Or is she the person who walked into my room and wake me up? Victor walked up behind me and studied the form standing there. Why he like to pee on your house? He thinks he's still in the bar, I whispered out the side of my mouth. Then I raised my voice and spoke to the intruder. You're not in a bar anymore, kid. As if he hadn't considered the notion before, the young man looked around and observed his surroundings for the first time. Hey, who turned out the lights in this here bathroom? I rolled my eyes. That's the point we're trying to make, I said flatly. You're not in a bathroom. I'm not? He zipped himself up and took another look around. Then he narrowed his eyes suspiciously before speaking. Isn't this the bar? Dumbass, said Ramon, looking down from the back porch. Shaking his head, he yanked open the kitchen door and went inside. Fritz growled his agreement. Uh, no, this is not the bar. This is our yard and you're peeing on our house. I walked to the gate he had left open and motioned that he should follow. He stumbled forward and scratched his head as I extended my arm. This is 3rd Street, I said, pointing at the expanse of concrete out front. That's where you want to go, I assume. And try not to pee on any of my neighbor's houses as you're leaving, please. Okay, man, thanks. He swayed several times, but he eventually made it to the sidewalk where he struck up a conversation with an invisible friend. Dude, he said, I was just in the bathroom and this dog comes out of nowhere and bites me on the leg. He reached down and pulled up his pant leg. Look, it even left a mark. The conversation continued until he stumbled out of sight. I secured the latch on the gate and returned to the kitchen. But instead of going up to bed like Victor and Ramon had, I put on my tennis shoes and grabbed a light jacket. Then I called for Fritz and hooked him up to his leash. If there was a gypsy standing under the witch's tree, I wanted to see for myself. All right, so there's the end of that chapter. How are we doing on time? We can, can we squeeze in one more chapter, I think? Yeah, so thanks for joining, everyone, if you're just signing on. Cheers. I'm doing vodka martini tonight. Shaking things up. I see some new faces, which is really good. And see lots of old faces, which is really good. So say hi. Let people know where you're from. Hey again, Ashley. Hey, Cousin Lisa. So uh, tell people how you know me. Uh, have you read my books and that's how you know me? Are you a cousin or a relative? Are you part of the Thursday slash Monday slash Tuesday night dinner club? Were you one of my students? I see a number of my students on here, which is always great. So, uh, hey, Don. Hey, Sue. Hey, Charles. Yeah, just say hi and talk to people and uh, let people know if you've been here. There's a number of troopers that have been here since not, uh, night one, so it's really great uh, to see people showing up every night. By the way, if you have missed uh, an episode or two, just go to my Facebook page and they're all there. And then Louisville Historic Tours has a YouTube channel and you can watch all these past episodes on um, YouTube. Louisville Historic Tours. And Sean Stafford, who's on here tonight, he's doing a lot of great work for us. Uh, he's uh, he's uh, Hunley Media. So if you're uh, looking for design people, he, he, he knows what to do. He's been great. Uh, Wes, uh, yeah, hey, Wes, uh, I, I was careful. So, yeah, let everyone know what you're drinking. Settle in, and we got, I think, another 10 minutes or so. I'm going to read one more chapter. And this chapter is kind of a cliffhanger, so you got uh, more incentive to come back tomorrow night. Okay, so this chapter is called Neptuna Petulengro. And uh, like I said, let's do another cheers. We made it uh, another day. 
Okay. Neptuna Petulengro. So remember, I'm going over to the witch's tree because I heard there is a, uh, a gypsy over there. Fritz looked back at me, or Fritz looked back at me as he tugged on the lead, happy to have scored such an early morning walk, and all by himself, no less. Rocky and Bess were soundly asleep, and I left them curled up on the back bed, so it was only Fritz and me out on the streets of old Louisville. That was probably the quietest time of night. At the end of the alley, we turned right onto Ormsby Avenue, crossed to the sidewalk and headed west, past a squat crepe myrtle, mounding with panicles of purple blooms. As we neared the intersection of 4th, the Puritan, a large apartment hotel built in the 1910s, loomed on the right. Half a block down, we passed on the left an enormous orange brick mansion from the 1880s that had been home to J.T.S. Brown. And uh, the Evers on here tonight know all about that place. Uh, J.T.S. Brown was the bourbon baron whose whiskey, Old Forster Bourbon, still enjoyed cult status as the bourbon of Louisville over 130 years later. Across from that stood the Mayflower, another snazzy apartment hotel built around 1919, and a hot spot of activity at a time when gangsters and bootleggers roamed the city. Across the corner from that was a J.B. Speedhouse, a rambling mansion from the 1880s, an artful collection of red brick gables and green trim. It cast a long shadow from the bright lights of the adjacent parking lot out across the street in front of us. At the corner was six. We took a left, went down the street, and passed a wrought iron gate at the entrance to Floral Terrace, one of the neighborhood's most hidden walking courts. And remember, if you heard some of the other stories, that's where the man from the killing tree is. Beyond that was the witch's tree. As we approached the corner, the spooky gnarled old tree emerged from the shadows behind a row of hedges. When we reached the tree, uh, when we reached the street, we veered right and followed the sidewalk that led to 7th Street. An hour must have passed since the policeman had seen the gypsy under the tree, so I assumed that she would have been long gone. Nonetheless, I hadn't given up hope of finding her. As we rounded the corner, the spooky tree never left my sight, and I was startled to see an attractive young woman with long hair and large hoop earrings sitting under its twisted, knotted branches. I fought the urge to stop and stare, and I kept on walking instead. We went halfway down the block, and I made myself turn around and skirt the corner a second time. Again, I saw the female with a dark complexion and a long skirt under the tree, apparently unaware of any passers-by. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw that she wore a white blouse with poofy peasant sleeves and delicate embroidery in pink and yellow thread around her neck. Her eyes, heavily outlined with mascara, were closed. I let Fritz drag me halfway down the block, but at the entrance to Floral Terrace, I made him stop and we turned around for another pass of the witch's tree. This time, however, we entered the gate into Floral Terrace and took an alternative route to get back to the witch's tree. We walked down the court where an alley led back to park, but before we headed back that way, we stopped at the fountain in the center. Amidst the tidy brick gambrels and American four-square houses, water splashed in a small pool. According to neighborhood lawyer, uh, another infamous tree had stood here for many years until residents felled it and replaced it with the fountain. This tree, however, was a tall cottonwood that reportedly had been used for lynchings, and locals referred to the ghost that still haunted the site as the man from the hanging tree. I had done some research on the subject, and although I was never able to substantiate that lynchings ever took place there, I was able to prove that a number of suicides had occurred at that location. The most famous took place in 1901, when a man by the name of Sam Turner decided to end his life. Under cover of darkness, he climbed the tall cottonwood, rope in hand, and sought the highest and sturdiest branch he could find. He shinned out to the end and tied one end around the branch and the other end around his neck, and then he jumped. The next morning, an early riser spotted his body swinging 40 feet up in the air, and a crowd of more than 500 turned out to watch as his corpse was lowered and taken away to the morgue. A chill ran down my spine as I realized that I was standing in the very same location as the crowd that turned out to watch Turner's body being cut down and carried away. So I 
tugged at Fritz's lead, and we made our way back to the witch's tree. As we rounded the corner for the third time, I saw that the woman's eyes were open and that she anticipated my arrival. What do you want? Tiredness edged her voice, which was not entirely unpleasant. I'm not a hooker, if that's what you're thinking. Oh, no, I stammered, fighting the blush that heated my cheeks. I didn't think that at all. Sorry, I was just out walking my dog. Awfully early to be out walking your dog, isn't it? She rolled her shoulders and reached a hand up to massage the back of her neck. I like walking around the neighborhood in the wee hours when there's nobody else around, I said. I like to imagine what it was like back in the day. Hmm. She ran her fingers through her hair and stifled a yawn. Awfully late to be out sitting under a tree, isn't it? I said. I reached down and patted Fritz on the head. He stood with his front paws on the curb, his nose eagerly sniffing something new in the air. Not really, she said. I guess you could say I'm a night person as well. With a hand heavy with gold and silver rings on its fingers, she motioned to a spot on the ground next to her. Have a seat. Lots of room here under my tree. Thanks. I walked a few steps up to the rise and sat down on a patch of bare, dry earth beneath two exposed roots. It was the exact same spot where I had been sitting the previous night when I discovered Josephine on one of the balconies. Fritz, tail wagging, sniffed the woman's extended hand and sat between us. By the way, my name's David, I said. She smiled. My name is Neptuna. Neat name, I said, rubbing Fritz behind the ears. Overhead in the branches of the witch's tree, something screeched and hopped from branch to branch. I was named after my father, Neptune. Neptune Petulangro. She leaned back against the mangled bark of the tree and looked up into the jagged limbs. Petulangro? Very exotic, I said. Is it Romanian? It could be, she said, stifling another lawn, but I'm not sure. It's the gypsy equivalent for Smith. My people used to make horseshoes. You're not really a gypsy, are you? I said. Damn straight. She brushed, it, brushed away a dead leaf that had fallen in her lap born and bred. You know, I had heard there were gypsies around here, but I didn't really believe it. I turned my head as a squirrel scampered out to the end of a branch and peered down at us. You don't really think of gypsies in Kentucky. Oh, we're all over the place. Trust me, we get around. You don't say. I was intrigued. So do you live here or what? Not really. She said, we pass through a couple times a year, though, and I make sure to come and visit my tree whenever we're in town. You know they call this the witch's tree, right? I reached out and studied Fritz, who had stood to growl at the squirrel above. Yeah, I've heard lots of stories about this tree, she said, and that's one of the reasons I love it so much. She, she scratched Fritz behind the ears and eased him back into a sitting position. Say, uh, do you know Josephine? I asked. Nope, she said. Who's that? Oh, supposedly some voodoo lady that lives in this building. I pointed to the balcony nearby. Voodoo lady? They got voodoo in Louisville? Supposedly, I said. I shifted my position to make myself more comfortable. I don't know for a fact, but the, she sure looks the part in any case, if you see her. How's that? She closed her eyes and rested her head against the trunk of the tree. Well, she's always wearing this turban and has a long, billowy skirt. From my position, I watched as two shadows skulked along a pathway in the park. Sort of like this one, she asked, her hand fluffing out the hem of her skirt. Yeah, sort of, I said. Well, you have to be careful, she said. Uh, looks can be deceiving. Yeah, I know. Never judge a book by its cover. I picked up an interesting stone lying at my feet, and I turned it over for inspection. It was light green, almost jade-like, and flecked with bits of brown. What about me? She asked with a wry smile. Do I look like a gypsy to you? Well, actually, I hesitated, worried that I might offend. You do, to a certain extent. Good, she chuckled, because I try to look like a gypsy. 
Why is that? I brushed a bit of dirt from the stone and rubbed its smooth surface between my thumb and forefinger. Well, most of us Roma dress like ordinary people nowadays, so you never know. But I like to stand out, so I wear the long skirt and the hoop earrings. She reached up with a finger and flicked one of the golden hoops. The earrings do the trick, I said. Off in the distance, the squeaky rattle of a shopping cart rumbled over the concrete of a walkway in the park. I conjured up an Im image of the stick witch out and about in search of twigs and branches. Neptuna rose gracefully and brushed off her knees. Well, I guess I should be moving on, she said, or else the cops might stop and make trouble for me again. We're leaving town in a few hours anyway. Well, it was nice talking to you. I got to my feet and waited while Fritz trotted over and said goodbye. Maybe I'll see you the next time you're around. Well, you know where to find me if I am. So where are you headed to now? I tugged Fritz away from her and stepped down to the sidewalk. Down to New Orleans, she said. Louisville's halfway there, north to south, south to north. That's how it's always been. That's how it's always been? I repeated, how long have you been doing this? Oh, as long as I can remember. She joined me on the sidewalk and shook several blades of dried grass from her skirt. And my grandparents and their parents used to do the same thing. She looked across to the park, reached out her arms, and then yawned. You've been around for a while. Go ahead and read up on it and you'll see. Take care. She flashed a grin at me and then turned and walked down the sidewalk. With her skirt swaying, she passed under the glare of a street light and disappeared into the darkness on the other side. I stood there for a minute and listened to the sound of the neighborhood. Then I turned to go, but I found myself face to face with a huge beast covered in black hair. That's where we're going to leave off tonight. Voodoo Days at La Casa Fabulosa. So turn in tomorrow night and we'll see what the beast was that found me on the sidewalk. So uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, no, Charles, I've ne I never saw her again. Um, and every time I go by the tree, I kind of hope I'll see her there. But that was really fascinating. And in the upcoming chapters, you're going to find out what I found out about gypsy history in Louisville. Uh, it's really fascinating. So tune in tomorrow night and we'll find out more about the real life gypsies in Louisville. And um, yeah, maybe I'll run into Cookie again. Uh, but what was it I found on the sidewalk? So you have to tune in tomorrow night. So thanks for tuning in, people. I uh, hope you're all doing well. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, send me a DM or comment as uh, you're live streaming. And I try to go back. Sometimes I might miss some, but we're getting a lot of uh, comments, which is great. I try to respond or at least uh, like every comment you make. So if, I, if you see that I haven't commented or responded, um, uh, I'm sorry. I just kind of overlooked it, but I try to go back and read everything. So thanks a lot. Um, yeah, thanks to you, Amanda and uh, Eileen and everyone else. Thanks for coming back. But um, yeah, two and a half weeks we've been doing this now. So uh, it's, uh, it's kind of my job now. Every night at nine o'clock, I, I make plans for this. So I hope you uh, look forward to it as much as I do. Um, yeah, uh, I'm hoping in two weeks when we finish the book, this will all be over and done with. If not, I'll have to find something else to do. Like I said, I might read uh, the first couple chapters of The House in Old Louisville, which we heard about uh, several nights ago. Uh, don't forget, if you haven't uh, seen all the episodes, go to Louisville Historic Tours channel on YouTube. Thanks to Sean Stafford. We got lots of uh, clips there. You can catch up. I think this is, um, this would be like our, what, our 17th night, I think, together. Uh, if you get a chance, go to LouisvilleHistoricTours.com, our website. See the good work Sean Stafford and Hunley Media have done. Uh, thanks to all who've gone to uh, Amazon and given Voodoo Days five-star reviews and True Ghost Stories and Eerie Legends from America's Most Haunted Neighborhood five-star reviews. It really, really helps a lot. And uh, if you're on TripAdvisor or Yelp, look us up, Louisville Historic Tours. 
and uh, give us some love because we've got competition in the neighborhood now. And you probably all know, but normally I'd be out at night, March 15th and November 15th, showing people around the neighborhood, trying to tell people uh, what a great neighborhood Old Louisville is. During the day, we focus on history and architecture tours. If you haven't done that already, you can check in at Old Louisville, America's Most Haunted Neighborhood. Let people know what you know about this great neighborhood. We're trying to get the word out and let people know about the fabulous architecture, the spooky stories, the interesting people we have. So I'm glad you turned out tonight, everyone, and uh, I really look forward to seeing you two tomorrow night. All right. So take care and uh, love to you all. Bye-bye.